Now we're talking about we're talking about the glory of God. In the uh, in the in the passages that we've looked at, the speakers that have been in front of us, and you realize, of course, either directly or by testimonial inference, you've heard about 26, I think, different people, different personalities, giving you some feeling of their the spirit in them, their understanding, their perceptions. And a lot of times, as I forget who said this about the hymn of the government, Brother Ricky, I think, a lot of, the, a lot of these are just views taken like this. Well, you know what I see? It's that kind of vision. It is. Because the hymn of the garment is actually a little higher than I thought. This is deeper water than I had ever anticipated. What we see here is, it's talking about the glory of God. You hear people talk about light, about brightness, about, wow, that was so beautiful I could barely look at it. That's where we're at. We're in this, we're in this area. Mm -hmm. Brother Jonathan brought to us that passage out of uh, Exodus. And I think it's significant in that in all of the scripture, the only direct reference of a friend to God in this kind of conversation was Moses. Now remember he makes that point. He said, uh, and he's referring back to God in Exodus uh, 33, 12, he says, Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast also found grace in my sight. Moses didn't want to go where he had to go alone. He wanted to go with the Lord. And the Lord said, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found, hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. That was a mercy to him. That was, you know, I've also, he said in another place there, I've been like a mother to you. The tenderness that we see from God is, <laughs> in view of his glory, is another one of those overwhelming thoughts, right? And, and Moses, and I'm not sure exactly, exactly what, why he said this, but he says, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. Show me thy glory. I, I, I want to know you. I, I want to I know. <laughs> and the Lord says, okay. <laughs> It was, it's amazing. I'll put you in a place. No man can look at this and live. He says, Behold, there is a place by me. Thou shalt stand upon a rock. Oh, brethren. And that's where we are today. We're on that rock. You know that, don't you? Anyhow, he comes by him. And he passes by. Now, here's another. We, and we have to address this. Like I said, there's going to be a lot of cooking going on when we get home. As, as we contemplate these things, the Lord God could have said anything he wanted. And you know what? He said exactly what, what he wanted to say. And this is the presentation that he made. He says, the Lord, comma, now again, this is capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. This is the eternal, self-existent one. And there aren't words in our, I don't think in our language, that understand the loftiness of this position. And then what he says, the Lord, using the same spelling again, the Lord God, the only one. And he goes on, and, and then here's this left turn or right turn. He says, merciful and gracious. Gracious? Long suffering. Now, typically, that's those things are those are polar opposites. Usually, somebody with great power doesn't have to be long suffering, and they let you know that. Now, it's long suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. Now, again, the Lord could have presented Himself in any way that He wanted, and He did. And this is it. He goes on to say, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, which immediately puts us in a, in a place of need, known need, right? Because we're guilty. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and to, upon the children's children under the third and the fourth generation. And Moses did that thing which was appropriate. He bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. Okay, that's, that's where we are. Now, also in the New Covenant, 
writings uh, in John, and I'm losing this little stand here. Not too much weight. In, in John 14, do you remember there when Jesus was having that uh, conversation with Philip? I, I think this also is significant. He says, um, they were speaking there. And Thomas said to the Lord, you know, he said, whether I go, you know, and so forth. Thomas said to him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? And Jesus, and this is significant, Jesus says to him, it's me. It's me. I am the way. It's me. I am the truth. Thomas, it's me. I'm the light. He revealed himself there, the glory of the Lord. If you had known me, you should have also have known the Father also, and from henceforth you know him and have seen him. Then Philip, bless his heart. Philip says, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus said, how would you like this? With your name, he uses his name. Have I been so long with you, yet thou hast not known me, Philip. See, he knew him. He knew him. He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou, thou then, show us the Father, the glory of the Lord. The glory of the Lord. This is a renewal. We are seeing, here's a summary statement, a summary statement of all the scripture. Boil this down. Now, there are more than, there are more than this in the scripture, but this is a good one, too. Um, we've ministered this to one another for years now. Out of 2 Corinthians 5, 19, that God, this summarizes everything in the whole scripture, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. That's the job. In all of these other things, and uh, among our brethren, again, we, we've shared this with one another, but it's significant to us. There was a giant on the field. Remember that? Was that the important thing? No. The two valleys, the armies that se separated the two armies, there were five smooth stones. There was one little guy. Are those the significant parts? No. No. That, those, are, those are things that help us to understand that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. See how he honored his name and he honored faith in him, his name that day as he did so many other times. Someone mentioned about David. Oh, bless his heart. David, David, Nathan, thou art the one. It bears repeating. Even in, even in all of that story, her that was wife of Uriah, her and all of that, the heat of that evening, it was God in his mercy revealing to us that he was reconciling the world to himself through Christ Jesus. The glory of the Lord is in the face of Jesus Christ. That revelation has come upon us. Show me thy glory. Just after the golden calf, again, I'm amazed that this, out of anything he could have said, those are the things that he said. You know, even in life, in the physical properties and, and states, uh, um, light itself is still very difficult to even define. I think this is on purpose. I think it's just another one of those things. That is it, is it, gra is it grains? You know, how is that seen? Is it waves or is it particles? What is, what is light? Well, the same thing. The glory of the Lord is revealed to those that say, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. See, that's how, that's, how that's, uh, that's how that's given to us. There have been a lot of uh, statements made during the last, like I said, there's probably been 25 or 26 different people that have stood here and have ministered very well. Thank you, brethren, by the way, for your ministry to us through the word. One of the statements that light, glory, that it overpowers darkness. I praise God for that. I have darkness in my heart. I want overpowered. Light does that. The whole earth is full of his glory. In view of that, consider how inexcusable 
unbelief is. Yes. Knowing that God is not willing that any should perish. How, brethren, how can we find ourselves in that position? We cannot. We cannot. We are inexcusable. Do you remember Lazarus? Of course, Lazarus. You know what that was all about? That was to send illumination. It wasn't just about raising Lazarus. They saw it in just a little while. They were going to kill Jesus and Lazarus again. Poor Lazarus. He had to die again, by the way. But the, the point of that was the glory of the Lord, the illumination of his, of his power. Whatsoever doth make manifest is light. And we turn from darkness to light. When Jesus said, peace be still, that was illumination. That was the Lord of glory speaking. So they could see that. Believe me, for the very work's sake, do that. Those are the works he's talking about. The gathering demoniac. I've thought about him for years. Remember when he was healed, he clothed and in his right mind. He said, I want to go with you, Lord. Let me go with you. The Lord said, no. He says, you go back and you tell them. You go back there and let your light shine. You go back there and you minister to them about the light of life. Show them the glory of God in Jesus Christ. Some issues in scripture were not left to any interpretation. Do you remember the time uh, when Jesus was, was tempted? There are things, again, now this, these are parts of Revelation that we're talking about. Satan's probing, Satan's position in the world, remember that? I'll give you all the glories of these things if you fall down and worship me. And what did Jesus in each one of those rely upon? The word of God. He believed the Father, the revelation, the light, the glory of God in that word. And his, in his incarnation that Phil just talked about, the heavenly host, they sung, up, they sung that night, glory to God in the highest, glory to God, a revelation from, from that world or that land to ours. So in view of just some of these summary statements and thoughts, I would like to give you opportunity to reflect somewhat upon what you've heard during this time, and not just that, but if you have a question, a specific comment, this is a really good time to get some feedback. Not only that now, there may be no one here that can answer your question directly, but it allows us all to think about these wonderful things. So this is a time for us to discuss. Um, and it, it, again, we don't have to set any records about how long or how short this is. We want this to be something that's valuable for you. If anybody has something they would like to say in Christ, say on. Okay. Um, first, I'd like to say that I really have appreciated this renewal. It has meant a lot to me. Um, last year, Maddie shared a little bit in her testimony how, um, how we were talking before we decided to do our Saturday meetings. And um, Maddie says to me, she says, do you, um, do you know what the topic of the next renewal is? And I said, no. She goes, oh, it's going to be divine glory. And I said, hmm, that's interesting. And I honestly, I have to admit this, I honestly didn't know how you were going to get several sermons out of divine glory. Oh, man. Yeah. So, but it really helps me with the Saturday meetings because we had to actually think about it. I thought, well, the last renewal was on the love of God. I can see that, but divine glory, that's just... Anyway, but the Lord really showed me his glory and how it was um, in this past year, especially in the past few weeks. Um, I think he was preparing me for this. Um, I have been, especially within the past few months, I have been very consumed with myself. I would think about me and, you know, oh my gosh, is my, does my hair look okay? Do I look okay? And all that. And it was just, it was taking away from God. And I knew it, but I didn't want to admit it, you know. And so, but God showed me within the past few weeks that these things are temporary and he doesn't get glory from the way we look or talk or anything. Like, I work at a pizza place um, that's really close to my house. 
And a few weeks ago, one of the ovens was leaking propane gas. And one of the girls in the pilot wasn't lit on the oven. So one of the girls went up to go light the pilot. She didn't know it was leaking gas. And the oven blew up. And she was standing right in front of it, and it burned her entire body. And God just showed me through that that, you know, see, I can take this away from you. And any time at all, this can all be gone from you. And that, you know, this is not what we're here for. We're here to give glory to God as best as we can here. And then when we, will be, when we are changed, that's when God's going to get the most glory. I can remember a time when I thought that glorifying God was like a mysterious thing that kind of you did, but you didn't really know what you did. You just sort of, it just happened. And, but it's, um, the Lord showed me, particularly by being around brothers of like precious faith, that um, when you expose something about God, when you make him known, when you divulge something that he's shown you about himself, you've just glorified God. Amen. You've just brought something of his person to the surface, to where Amen. people can see it. Amen. You've glorified God. Amen. 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 There's a good point that just made right there. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracle of God spokesman for God, mouthpiece for God in that way. We've, you've had that. I don't know if everybody is as aware of that as, as keenly as, as we should be, but we've had, we've had a lot of very good sound scriptural teaching this week. It's been excellent. Again, I recommend to you, all of you that can get some of the media in the back for your own use and order this set too because reviewing this will be, it's going to be good for all of us. I've already done that. I recommend it to you, too. This media he was talking about, um, Brother Ricky, uh, Brother Bob, actually, um, actually it was Sister Maddie, gave Brother, Bob, uh, Brother Ricky a iPod, and Brother Ricky had this good idea of downloading sermons and stuff onto this iPod so he could listen to it at work. And... Um, that, I was like, well, that's really good. I was telling some of the brethren here about it. Uh, I was thinking, you know how the ungodly, they, they go out of their way to find out more ways of being ungodly. And I was thinking, you know, this is a, a good way for the, the, the godly to be, look for, use their imagination how to, how to get more of God. And I was praying well, I went on the internet to see how much these iPods were, and they're a little more than I thought they were. <laughs> I was like, oh, that was like a week's paycheck to get this iPod. So I was praying for the Lord to, to uh, I said, Lord, well, my, t my tape player was broke in my truck. It was eating my Bible tapes, and I'm like, well, I can't have that. So I said, Lord, I need you to fix my tape player or something. And the next day, I found this RCA Lyra didn't even know what it was until I brought it to church and asked Brother Bob what it was. But it, it holds information. And so I, I was downloading. Brother Aaron has been downloading for me every time I come to church uh, sermons and stuff. And I can't tell you how blessed I've been Amen. by listening to past renewals and sermons and Bible on these all day. on the Because the job I got... See, I got this uh, tape adapter, and of course it doesn't have a tape in it. It just adapts into your tape player, so my tape player plays that. So all day I could just listen to this stuff, and I have been so blessed. But what I was going to say was this. I would encourage, also encourage you to get these MP3s that Brother Aaron has labored on, and he's, he's really wanting all of you to be blessed by this, and find a way you could listen to these things. Go out of your way. Figure out a way to listen to them because I guarantee you will be blessed. I told a few of you in the last 73 years, I've heard several hundred sermons and preached a few. But this morning, the message by Jonathan and by Jason were the finest I've ever heard. And yet I was talking this over with Jonathan about the Ephesians 1, 10 and 11 here, the, many of these passages have been from Ephesians. I want to tell you, Ephesians is the greatest book in the world on the unity and glory of the church as the body of Christ. 
And we've talked a good deal about the, what it does for us and our hope of the sharing of the glory of God uh, by receiving simply Christ to dwell in our hearts. One idea has not been presented that is obscure in several translations, but in a few has been very plain. You know, it's been my privilege and duty for more than half a century to teach Greek and Bible interpretation, and I have quite a collection of different versions. I've heard several different ones quoted here today. What I want to bring out is that the book, let me read the verse here according to the New American Standard Version. You find the number here. In the 10th verse, with a view to the administration suitable to the fullness of the times. That's rather obscure in the most translations. The, um, I forget now the old phrase, that's so obscure, but the, the thing is, uh, they say to sum up all things in Christ. Reading in Greek, it's interesting to say, to make under one head all things, both in heaven and on earth. And when we think of this time of the glory of Christ, uh, being unquestioned and all that are with him are full of him. It's great that uh, you think of everything being under the headship of one wise, benevolent, perfect, holy master. Amen. Then it goes on, also we have obtained an inheritance. Now, being a Greek teacher and grading a lot of papers and so forth, I, I think people ought to stick to what the Greek actually says. It says we were made to be an inheritance. We were made to be his heritage. This was put into the New Testament by the, the um, revision made in 1881 by a committee of 70 or more of the finest scholars in America and in England. It was reprinted in America as the American Standard Version 1901. It's the best literal translation I know of anywhere yet, but it's better Greek than it is English sometimes. It is not as clear and useful to our present generation. As, so I was glad to see new translations come on throughout the, see I graduated from high school in 1931, began to be a Bible student then after that, and, and all the time since then, hoping that people get a better view of some of these key passages. But uh, the Revised Standard Version practically left out the idea of inheritance in the verse. The New American Standard said, and I just read it, we were made, we were given an inheritance. I don't know why they don't just take the word for what it says. We were made to be his inheritance. Now the 18th verse of the same chapter, Paul says, I pray that you may know the hope of his calling and the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. The, uh, one of the new translations I like says among the saints. But, uh, and that's not a bad translation of that word as possibility, but I think he's saying the saints comprise his inheritance. I didn't hear this idea of this last two or three days, and I thought it might be profitable to you to think. We can be something for him. Hey. He's not only much to us, yeah. and we have a lot from him. That we've emphasized. I'd like to have you have your heart filled with a desire to be something valuable to him. Yeah. We are his inheritance. Yeah. He has purchased for himself a kingdom and a people. Yeah. And God keeps saying, I will be their God, they will be my people. Yeah. We read about his own possession, 114. Somebody. That's, that, that's the same, same idea. That salvation is what we got, and we're what he got. It's the view of the, of the bride of Christ. It's, yeah, we're the Lord's, the Lord's heritage. We're the Lord's, in other ways, we were the Lord's field, the Lord's house. I mean, this is, this is sort of the same idea. It's marvelous. There's uh, something that came to me. We were talking about Exodus 34. About the glory of the Lord, that there's uh, is the great salvation of God. There's two, two different societies that's viewing it, and they see something different from the human point of view. It's the power of God. <laughs> from the angelic point of view, it's the wisdom of God. 
See that? I mean, how are you going to impress angels with power? I mean, they've seen, but now wisdom. That's, <laughs> and they, and then as I understand it, when we are partake of glory in its fullness, this is one aspect that's going to flower out is the magnificent wisdom that has been uh, is revealed in salvation that he has actually brought a people to glory and when they get there they're like him Amen. <laughs> I, I glory in that these two different sides uh, two different sides of salvation so the fact that if you know something about God then God's glory has been revealed to you Excellent. and you ought to be you ought to be very very thankful uh, for that revelation and I'll just I'll just add this little this little tag to that and then I'll sit down um, God's glory, when he manifests his glory to you, that's, that's not something necessarily that just happens intellectually or academically. Uh, you, you need the scriptures. You need to do your best to understand the scriptures and for exactly what they say. Don't get me wrong. But if, if we understand God spiritually, God, and God manifests himself to us spiritually, he's got to do that. In your mind. That's why there are many, many people that read the Bible. They read the Bible and they, they don't understand it. Or they read the Bible and they, they distort it. They got the same Bible we do. How does that happen? I mean, all they got to do is read the words, right? Just read the words. Or, or you know, like Brother Seth has studied Greek all his life. And I took Greek and Hebrew in seminary and all I wasn't very good at it. But, you know, you stay out of those things. And yet still there are people that have radically different understandings of God and of what the text says, and it could say this, and it could mean this, and, you know, what's all that about? Well, you see, you're, you're, God manifests His glory. You, you, you go to the text, of course. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying we throw the Bible out, that we sloppy about the Bible. Not at all. But, but the, the, the Spirit of God has to work mm -hmm. in your heart, personally, uh, for, for His glory to be manifested. I wish I could say it a little bit better than that, but I hope you understand and follow what I'm saying. You, God's got to reveal His glory to you personally. And of course that's going to come out of the text of Scripture and from the Word being preached and all of that, but it's got to be something that God does in you personally. It's got to be understood spiritually. The doctrine is understood spiritually. That's why many of you understand things about God even though you don't know Greek or you don't know Hebrew, you've never read theology and all those, but you still know God. How'd that happen? Well, of course you read the Bible, but God revealed His glory to you personally. You see, because He revealed it to you so that you would not take credit. If you'd learned it on your own, then you could boast about it. So oftentimes, boast and glory is uh, used interchangeably. But God won't share. That's the glory that he won't share. Amen. So I don't care how intelligent you are about the Bible. Where you can quote it all. There is no glory there if you learned it on your own. You must depend on God for to reveal. I have found, because some of the wise brethren have reminded me often, that if we come expecting Amen. and desiring, Amen. we won't go away disappointed. Amen. Well, anybody that doesn't Go home with a wagon load or two. <laughs> Wasn't expecting <laughs> or desiring. And uh, <clears throat> there was two things I thought of uh, in the past, uh, and, and I'm not saying whatever anyone else has said is wrong. I'm just saying because um, I, I know my learning is kind of down in here, but Brother Given has said more than once that God wrote his own dictionary. So when I stopped trying to figure it out from other books, I, I made progress. And, and I, when they would talk, then I could understand more. And, and I want to thank God for that. And then um, Brother Fred had a term that he used pretty often, and it was tolling the hogs along with corn, just enough to keep them coming. <laughs> well, I like that thought, because if, it, if, you, if you're hungry, he has what you need and, and what is necessary to bring you to glory. And so um, having seen that then, I was more determined. And just another thing quickly, there was um, uh, about a three year period that I, when I first came together with the brother and I'd never known what 
it was to be one with Christ. I didn't. But I had to leave. And I was quite grieved because I knew what my whole life was. And I was really thinking that I would go back to that because I wouldn't find brethren out there. I knew they weren't out there. Well, uh, they gave me a plaque. God's grace will never lead you where his grace cannot keep you. And, and when I was alone, I learned that song, Higher Ground. Now, I'd been singing it, but I learned it. Well, he is able. Thank the Lord for that. But um, uh, we have his word that we are fed by, and so we're without excuse. But as the brethren were talking about glory, I, I had looked, because of the topic, in the dictionary. And I know it gives it the best that man can, but I used these words and kind of made my own uh, thing. But um, glory is being worthy of great honor and admiration. And I thought that's fine if it's applied to God. Vain if it's talking about men. It will perish. And um, doing something important but only God through Christ could do that which was necessary, but most important for our being one with him. And uh, that is to bring us to eternal glory. It's an ongoing thing. It's not a once and settled. It's ongoing. And um, on our part, it's a working uh, or worship and admiration and praise. And on our part, that's com complete commitment to God in what we think or say or do, and the highest, most radiant splendor. That's our God Amen. and his son. Amen. And um, in that day when he makes up his jewels, I was thinking uh, as we sang the song, face to face, when we behold him, he will be the greater glory because he's seen those that his I and the children that you have given me. And we've been kept by that power and might. And so the most glorious thing will be God's, uh, what he has received, because he's desired it from the very beginning. That was his purpose in bringing us uh, to the knowledge of him. Yeah. And so he's, he wants to complete it, and we're to be a faithful spokesman and a servant for him. And then just in closing, once we were bankrupt completely, there was nothing in us that was worth salvaging except God. <laughs> God who had made us wanted fellowship with us. So I would ask now, how serious am I or anyone else to be in his image, in his likeness, his most glorious likeness? When we are called, will we be able to stand in that day? Something for us to consider, not take for granted. Amen. You know, if you've got something in your life that stands between you and the Lord, cut it off and cast it from you or gouge it out now. Um, something Brother Seth mentioned to us about making some decision, making up your mind to follow, as for me in my house, what are we going to do? You know, saying, well, maybe later, that's a decision. Or saying nothing, that's a decision. Understand that. We are uh, stewards of this time. That's what you've got. And know it that today is the day of salvation. Today. Today. I like to make contrasts in my preaching. I do that all the time. And thinking about divine glory, the title divine glory, uh, caused me to survey again and think about uh, the record in Scripture of how God brought down human glory. Mm -hmm. Let me read you this text here from Daniel chapter 4. The king, Nebuchadnezzar, reflected and said, Is this not Babylon the great, which I myself have built as a royal residence by the might of my power and for the glory of my majesty? Well, we know the rest of that record. We could go through all of scripture, uh, from the flood uh, to the tower of Babel, where God reached into the minds of men and changed their capacity for communication in a moment, in an instant, and their glory was taken from them. Uh, Egypt, the plagues, uh, how they were uh, 
devastated. God just devastated them. Uh, their gods, uh, all that they had had for themselves going on down through the other nations, uh, the seven nations of Canaan, the land was taken from them again and again and again and again. Then to our own generation, uh, the monuments that men have built for themselves, whether it be buildings or businesses or places of education, uh, we here in the good old USA, uh, what was it, uh, approximately a, a, a generation ago, someone uh, said in the future everyone will be famous for 15 minutes. That kind of thinking, you know. And here we have this record, this, this simple brief uh, record of God's glory that was revealed and, began, and then affirmed again and again and again. The same truth again and again and again held up for us over and over and over and over divine glory for those who will believe it. For those who will believe it and then participate in it. Amen. Involve themselves in it. Give themselves to it. Amen. Uh, the scripture speaks about our conversation. I like that word because it, uh, it denotes something fuller than just the words that we speak. It's like a total communication of our life. Where people find us and, and what we look like and what we say and how we act and what we prefer. Uh, it, our life is a conversation and also the glory of God and the, the uh, correlation between the two now God is invisible uh, Brother Boyce mentioned you know the how light is invisible now I also would like to point out that these notes that I'm going to share with you now come about a page and a half before his message and uh, about some of the others but that how would an invisible God teach his creation about himself? They're all created. Everything is below him. And yet God is altogether beautiful. He's wonderful. And he's willing for th those things which he has made to know him. Amen. It's right. It's meat. For, in order for him to be rightly admired for him to be known. Amen. Well, I'd like to talk about the, the suitability of what it is that proclaims God. You see, whenever um, there has to be a compatibility between the thing crafted and the tool that, that works upon it, that's one element of uh, making something demonstrated. But I want uh, to th I think about art. Somebody mentioned art also. Art can be very degenerate because it's in the hands of man. But the principles of what art is, it's an expression. It, it, um, it isn't just what my daughter calls furniture art, just something with color on it to put someplace. But true art has a, a quality to draw something out of us. And it has many expressions. You can't confine yourself just to think of a painting whenever you think of art. Well, to select a theme, all right, let's say you, you were going to create something and what you were trying to express was um, light. So what medium will you choose to express light? Will you choose sound? Will you choose rock or paint or water or sand or plants or air or grass? What is it would you use to, to explain light to to make it evident to someone else to portray its qualities another uh, theme strength would you use wind or cloth or wood or clay to show strength see there there are limitations in all of these things well what about if you want it to express truth or love or immortality see it gets harder as you start talking about the qualities of god what is there that God made that would be able to demonstrate and to show forth his glory? And what he chose was man. And just a, just a thought here too.
thinking about in the garden. Whenever God, God taught us a lot more in the garden than I think we've seen just yet. We tend to, to kind of hit on that and then keep on going because that was the beginning and we've got places to go from there. But whenever God made and helped me for Adam, he made her out of his own flesh and blood. He took Eve from the side of Adam. He didn't make a separate creation. He had to make somebody who could know Adam, someone who would share the qualities of Adam. Well, whenever God made his church, he created her and his son. The church is his body. Now, someone else mentioned this, but this was a glorious thought whenever I thought of it, too that a man is over everything God created, Amen. God accepted. Amen. A man is. Amen. Doesn't say that of the angels. Whenever you see the largeness of what we've been brought into, it would, it would provoke a, God, a godly response would be one of, of increased desire. There's no one in here that is not capable of giving more glory to God than we have given him thus far. You have, your capacity has not been discovered yet. And it's that same God who ordained this glory that will cause you to show his glory forth here and in the world to come. So it provokes this holy zeal and desire to see what God created us able to see. It's like he said, I made you so you can see this. Now that, that makes me go, then Lord, help me to look. Help me to, to find what it is that, that you've directed my vision to. And then whenever we talk about, um, I, I've cut my teeth on the scripture, all have sinned. And I'm not going to tell you what camp I grew up in. It doesn't make any difference. But even though the second part of that is, is uh, said with it, I always sense that I, the import of it was missing. Like all have sinned, that part I got, and come short of the glory of God. I knew it was important, but I didn't know why it was important. Now, this is not the first time we've been thinking on these things, but it's a serious a very serious, it's a, it's a condemning flaw to fall short of the glory of God, to fail of the purpose for which we have been created. Um, whenever, whenever somebody was telling me one time, so well, I'm a pretty good person. God probably will let me into heaven, which was foolish talk. And so I really haven't done anything bad. And I says, well, but what have you done to merit being able to stand uncondemned in his presence? See, what you have to do is not convince God that you haven't done anything really, really bad. What you've got to be able to do, if you don't want to have to confess a savior, the only savior, is you've got to go to heaven and stand in the presence of his glory and say to God, I'm here because I deserve to be. I'm as good as you are. Now, if you can't do that, then you need a savior because you've fallen short of the glory of God. If at any time anybody has ever seen us or heard us and they haven't been reminded of our maker, then we've fallen short of his glory. By his grace, we will, we will uh, be able to, to rise up and to enter into that glory to which we've been called. See, that's part of that inheritance that we were talking about. Whenever, whenever the other principalities and powers and creatures, some of whom we may not have heard of, when they look at the aggregate church in the, in the world to come, they're going to see Christ. That's, they'll, they'll see his body. That's what we're being brought to. We're part of that. And it'll take us all 
to show forth his glory. But he is, that's the glory of the church, is our Lord. Just for uh, 30 seconds, I want to just uh, give thanks to you, brethren, for, uh, uh, well, I want to give glory to God for uh, helping me in this, uh, through the surgery. And I, I mention this uh, because your prayers were involved in this uh, back in April. And uh, I, I'm not going to go into any more detail than that, but I, I want to just give thanks and I, because you uh, were involved in this and your prayers and, and the Lord helped me, and I, I thank him for that. Now, what I would like to say uh, <clears throat> regarding uh, glory is uh, the, regarding uh, the foretaste of it. And uh, we, I think of a text that James and, first, uh, in, and also in First Peter, and they, they say almost the same thing. One says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Amen. And the other one says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you in due time. Now, so this is a, this is a way that we, are, we foretaste, uh, like a foretaste of glory. And it's a God-appointed way. See, it's not, say, and so what I'm saying is the way, the way up for us right now is down. See, so, and you know, this is, uh, in other words, if you try to go up, the Lord will cast you down. He, everyone, if, a man, if a man exalts himself, he shall be abased, right? But if a man abases himself, he shall be exalted. But, but uh, now this, is, this can be like an interpretation of trouble. You know, we all, uh, we all go through uh, various kinds of trouble in this life. And, uh, but, you know, if, if you look at trouble this way, you know, that, that, like this is the way down. So this is, now here's this, uh, think of like what James says. Now humble yourselves under the mighty hand of, now to think of the mighty hand of God is, is his hand upon you in the trouble, see? So humble yourselves under that, whatever the nature of the trouble is, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you in due time, see? And on the way up, see, you'll have a, you'll have a foretaste of glory. And it'll be, it will be a God-appointed way. It'll be a way that he approves of and that, that's, that gives glory to him in his sight. In uh, Acts chapter 25, this is uh, 